gospel of Jesus Christ was brought from Israel to other nations through a dividing wall of hostility. And this is one of the beautiful but difficult callings of the gospel, and that is to tear down the walls of hostility between his people and the people who are far from him. And so in light of that calling, as clearly spelled out in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 today, we will apply this text by reaching out to those who are far from God. And if you yourself are far from God, if you are among the Gentiles described in this text, initially you are far from God, outside of the promises of God, without hope. Today, would you come home to the family of God, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, give your life to him and be saved and take your place here within the family of God. If you are far from him, would you be reconciled to him today? If you are a wayward prodigal Christian, would you come home into the grace of God today? Let's open to Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. It's page 976, and the Bible's in the seats with you. For context, this wall of hostility between the Jew and the Gentile, from the Jewish side and from the Gentile side, both of them were based in misconceptions and pride. From the Jewish perspective, looking at Gentiles, Gentile meaning somebody who's not Jewish, from the Jewish perspective, looking at Gentiles, it was thought that Gentiles were fuel for the fires of hell. It was forbidden for a Jewish midwife or doula to help a Gentile woman give birth because that would be bringing another Gentile into the world. When Jews would come home to Jerusalem, they would avoid Samaria because the people of Samaria were merely half Jewish. And when they stopped at the edge of Jerusalem upon coming home, they would remove the dust from their feet so as not to bring Gentile dirt into Jerusalem. There was a wall of hostility between the Jew and the Gentile. And when a Jewish son or daughter would marry a Gentile, the family would have a funeral for their quote-unquote lost child who just married into a Gentile family. It's remarkable because here we sit, a crowd of mostly Gentiles, reading a text about reaching out to those who are far from God, and among that crowd is, in fact, today, in our context, Jews who deny that Jesus is the Messiah. Isn't that ironic? Now we are called to reach out to those who are far from God. Gentiles, meanwhile, because of this hostility, viewed Yahweh with skepticism. They thought that Yahweh didn't like them because Yahweh's people didn't like them very much. And they had, uh, they had a view of Yahweh as though he were obsolete or irrelevant. Now, it, it, that's striking because today, in our context, Seattleites view God with skepticism. They have mixed feelings about God because they will define him based on the worst behaviors of those who claim his name. And they may view him as obsolete or irrelevant. So it's striking to me how we have everything and nothing in common with the original recipients of this. In some ways, the context of this original, the original audience for Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, was very far from us because it was addressing the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. But in some ways, we have a great deal in common because we live among people who likewise are far from God and are called to bring them home. As we do this, as we seek to reconcile those who are far from God to their Father, as we seek to eliminate senses of tribalism that would ostracize those who are far from God, as we do all of this, may we not compromise one iota of the truth of the Word of God. Amen? We must bring about that reconciliation without compromising one iota of the truth of God. Paul, the apostle, was called of God to this very ministry. Here's kind of a picture of Paul's ministry. He was the consummate Jew of ultimate pedigree, circumcised on the eighth day, tutored by Gamaliel, who was tutored by Hillel, the equivalent to having a PhD from Harvard in the Jewish context. He was the ultimate Jew on the scale from one to Jewish. He was quite Jewish. And he was the one, he was God's chosen instrument to reach out to the Gentiles and to bring the gospel to them. This news would get him nearly torn apart in the book of Acts as he confesses that to the Sanhedrin. Here's a picture of, of Paul's ministry being both Jewish and called to reach Gentiles. An animation to sort of show exactly what we're describing. If you think of Paul as in the center 
Much of his calling was to bring Jews and Gentiles together. Much of the message of this text is to bring about this ministry of reconciliation between the two that a temple would be built from both. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. There was sort of another but God in that sentence. Did you hear it? (laughs) But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, to the Gentile and to the Jew. For through him we have both access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Go back to verse 11 with me, because there's profanity in it. I'm just kidding, not really. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the um, uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made made in the flesh by the hand. Circumcision was this mark of the covenant in the Old Testament sense. As we saw in the book of Galatians, Paul had strong opinions about people who wanted to bring that back as though it were still necessary for salvation. Now, this term, the uncircumcision, that is used to refer to people who are Gentiles, had a strong pejorative sense. It was on the verge of being a slur when our own beloved King David was calling out Goliath, the Philistine. He used this, he used this pejorative slur to refer to Goliath. Look at, look at 1 Samuel 17, 26. You didn't know there was cursing in the Bible, did you? <laughs> And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? These are fighting words. These are fighting, this had had heavy cultural implications for him to refer to Goliath this way. Now, let it be known, this hostility was not just from Jew toward Gentile, it was very much from Gentile toward Jew. So anybody who has studied the history of World War II can attest. Right, this hostility worked in both directions, and it's also biblical. There's also examples in the Bible of people showing hostility toward Jews. Look at John 18, verse 35. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered, delivered you over to me. What have you done? Right, you you got to hear the scathing, the scathing incredulity in Pilate's voice. Am I a Jew? Right, uh, and also in Acts, chapter 16, verse 20, Paul and Silas experienced strong anti-Semitism. In Acts 16, 20, and when they had brought them into the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. As though that were the shocking accusation. This hostility, this wall of hostility, exists on both sides of the discussion. I led a man to Christ many years ago. A dear friend, Howard Weinstein is his name. You can imagine what kind of family Howard Weinstein grew up in, right? For him, the gospel of Jesus Christ was revelatory, beautiful, and transformative. It was also healing for his soul. He experienced bullying as a child growing up. As a fifth grader, a crowd of sixth graders, once singled him out, physically beat him up because he was Jewish. 
growing later on and confronting these bullies, asking them, why? Why would you beat up the Jewish kid? They said, because the Jews killed Jesus. You imagine Howard's answer? <laughs> Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> it's through the Jews that salvation was possible. This hostility exists on both sides. Jew toward Gentile and Gentile toward Jew. In our context, it may be difficult to imagine, but it's important that we understand this text in light of the original historical cultural context because it's still applicable today. And you may not have hostility towards Gentiles. You may not have hostility toward Jews. But would you search your heart in light of the message of this text? Do you think that God wants only the hostility between Jews and Gentiles torn down? Or do you think that he, do you think that he is okay with hostility existing between other tribes of people? Do you think that the kind of hostility that God wants to dismantle brick by brick is only that between the Jew and the Gentile? Would you search your heart if you have hostility toward a people group? Do you think that this text would let it stand? Can you in good conscience maintain that prejudice in light of the message of this text? I believe that God wants walls of hostility torn down. That's how we apply this text today. This is what God did between the Jews and the Gentiles. It's a beautiful thing the way that Paul, our earthly author, inspired by the Holy Spirit, personified this very mission. The consummate Jewish authority reaching out to the Gentiles. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5 of the Old Testament law? He has not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. That not one stroke of the pen, not one letter of the law would disappear. Therefore, this Old Testament law serves as the foundation, the pedestal upon which New Testament gospel salvation is built. We have been born at a most fortuitous time. Even if you adhere to the youngest of young earth theories, the majority of human history has been presided over by the Old Testament. If you were having a rough weekend, it just got a little bit better because you're so blessed simply to have been born when you were born. You may, have, you may have never taken the time to thank God that you were born in the year that you were born, you're born in a year that we now call A.D. Would you take a minute just to thank God for that because most of the people who have lived and died have lived and died wondering the name of the Messiah? And you know it. Somebody told you the name. If you were born and raised in a church, look how incredibly blessed you are compared to most of human history. This is a blessed and sweet time. Now, verse 12, addressing, speaking directly to Gentiles, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Does that describe you, my skeptical friend today? Are you just apart from God? You have no actual hope? You don't know what's going to happen when you die. You don't know anything about this promise that God made to his people. You, you're, you're completely new to this. This, is, this. You're a stranger to this news that God made a promise to Abraham to make a great nation through him and that through that nation all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This is news to you. If so, you might see a reflection in this text, especially verse 12. Jesse, that sounds like me. I am without hope. I'm cut off from God. Well, tune in because there's beautiful news in this text. There's beautiful hope in this word. Look at verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There was a literal partition in the temple of worship in the Old Testament that separated out the court of the Gentiles from the portions of the temple wherein only Jews were allowed. Upon the cross, this crucifixion, there was this curtain, this dividing wall it was torn from top to bottom as Jesus died. Not from bottom to top. This is quite a sturdy curtain, mind you. So it would be pretty impressive if men were able to tear this curtain. But just so it's clear, it was torn from top to bottom to show this dividing wall. Now the dwelling of God is with men, not even within this temple itself. So not only is the dividing wall separating the court of Gentiles from the Jews eliminated by this text, but the temple itself is eliminated Jesus, upon seeing the temple, originally built by the instructions given from God to Solomon, then rebuilt in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, no, though not quite to its original glory, this temple was disassembled brick by brick in the year AD 70. When the tensions between 
Roman authorities, the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem came to a fever pitch. And the Romans, convinced that there was gold hidden in the walls of the temple, disassembled the temple brick by brick. Jesus prophesied that this would come true, declared that it would be so, and it was. Here's Jesus' prediction, prophecy in Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was going away, and when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Jesus' prophecy came true in the year AD 70. Matthew 27, verse 50 and 51, while Jesus is upon the cross. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Now, Orthodox Jewish friends who may be watching, who tuned in with us. I don't want your heart to be harmed by what I'm going to say. Please give me time to clarify once I've said it. I am glad that the temple was destroyed. Here's why. This text, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, describes God's intention to build a temple, both Jews and Gentiles, of which Jesus himself is the cornerstone. I'm glad that that temple is gone because he's building a new one in this room. Now today we, Jew and Gentile alike, are this temple and Jesus is its cornerstone. Were that temple to still exist today, I believe that modern day Jews would have a hard time coming to Christ. Moreover, the stage is set for biblical prophecy to be fulfilled because of what's taken place in Jerusalem. I, for one, am grateful that that temple is no longer standing because now this temple, now, where is the Holy Spirit of God, Christian? Then you. Aren't you grateful to have been born when you were born? Aren't you grateful for the work of God? Do you see now the message of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, leaping from the page to grip you by the heart where the Holy Spirit himself may dwell? This is a source of great pain for our Jewish brothers and sisters, that the temple no longer exists. This is the reason why many Orthodox Jews no longer carry out the Orthodox sacrifices. Have you ever wondered that? The Old Testament calls for Jews to carry out these ritual sacrifices. Why aren't they? Well, it's because the temple's no longer there. Do you know there's a Muslim mosque sitting on the foundations that once served as the base for Solomon's temple? All that remains is one small section of wall called the Wailing Wall. Today, people will go to Jerusalem and write prayers on pieces of paper and scroll them up and stuff them in the cracks of the wall. Today, a Muslim mosque called the Dome of the Rock sits on that foundation. So there is no more temple. Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24, 1 and 2, came absolutely true. Look to verse 15 with me. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God, Jew and Gentile, in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Jonah, the prophet, struggled with this. He was called by God to go to Nineveh. He tried to run away to Tarshish. The reason that Jonah didn't want to obey God's call to go to Nineveh and to tell them, listen, God's wrath is coming, watch out, God's wrath is coming, was because he was afraid that God would show grace. He was afraid that God would show mercy. He was afraid that there would be mass repentance. He was afraid that people would be spared. Jonah wanted to watch the fireworks. He wanted Nineveh Nineveh to become another Sodom and Gomorrah. This is why Jonah is called the least of the prophets. (laughs) Listen to Jonah. Listen to how deep this hostility went. Listen to how profoundly needed God's ministry of reconciliation really was. Jonah 3, 10 through 4, 2. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Have you ever struggled with that? Right? God pouring out his wrath and mass numbers of people dying in the Old Testament. Do you know that he almost did the same thing to Nineveh, but instead it was one of the greatest revivals in, the, in human history? God did not pour out his wrath because they repented, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. He should be relieved. He should be celebrating. But it displeased him, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, at least he's honest, (laughs) 
O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. He says that like it's a bad thing. He is upset that God has relented. He's upset that God showed mercy. He's upset that the people repented. There was a strong, strong pride and the people of Israel is God's chosen nation. And now this word reconcile being taught in verse 16 just flies in the face of that long-held hostility. I'm gonna tell you a story of a time that I met speechwriter with the commander of Israel's army. But first, look at verse 18. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Romans chapter 11 gives this beautiful metaphor for Israel as the chosen vine and Gentiles as the engrafted branches. God chose Abraham, he chose Israel, he chose the descendants of Jacob over the descendants of Esau, even though Esau was born first. He chose Israel as this nation through whom he would bless all nations, that we would look upon it, he would, we would all see that he alone is God, and above him there is no other. He prophesied their story before it happened. He told them ahead of time how the whole story would go. And all of this, the chosen vine of Israel, is the basis upon which the, the, the gospel was built because Jesus was born through all the prophecies spoken to Israel. And now everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Israel was chosen, and now Gentile nations are engrafted in. That's the beautiful imagery of Romans chapter 11. Here is the foundation for that imagery. Here is Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 8. Leading up to the prophecy, the teaching of Israel as the chosen vine, Gentiles as the engrafted branches, here's Romans chapter 9. I am speaking the truth in Christ. Paul, our same author of Ephesians. I am not lying, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever, amen." But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. The ethnicity of the, uh, of the, of the Hebrew nation became diluted upon its conception as a nation. Its ethnicity was perhaps at its most pure while they were slaves in Egypt. But after the exodus, upon beginning their conquest of the promised land of Canaan, God began to dilute the ethnic purity of the nation of Israel, deliberately so. I'll give you an example, Rahab. She was a prostitute and a spy in the city of Jericho who help the nation of Israel, and then she's assimilated into it. Moreover, she's a part of Hebrews 11, isn't she? The hall of faith, isn't that beautiful? I'll give you another example, the book of Ruth. This is, a, this is in a rocky, difficult time under the judgeship of Jer. Ruth was a Moabitess, a nation with whom Israel had warred previously. When she, in Ruth 1, tells Naomi, her Jewish mother-in-law, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die and be buried. May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And she follows her mother-in-law north, across the Jordan River, south into Bethlehem. At the time of the barley harvest, you're seeing a Gentile conversion in the Old Testament. And Ruth becomes a part of the genealogy that would lead to Jesus. So there are multiple examples throughout the Old Testament of the, of the ethnic concentration of God's chosen nation being diluted as Gentiles would be engrafted in throughout the Old Testament, professing their faith in Yahweh, carrying out the law of Moses, which, for, which told of their faith in the Messiah who would one day come. And now, now, as God has chosen Israel to make salvation possible, now, here's the beautiful news of Romans chapter 10, 
everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here's Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 13. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, meaning Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. My skeptical friend who came in here wondering, why do you as Christians read a Bible that tells you not to eat shellfish, but you eat shellfish? Why do you as Christians read a book that tells you not to cut the hair on the sides of your head? Why are you picking and choosing what you obey and what you don't obey? I'm going to read that verse again. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who what? Believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. That's the Old Testament law. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Who's heard that verse before? For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you call upon the name of the Lord? Do you see how deep the roots of salvation grow? Look how sturdy the foundation. Look how steadfast the promises. Every iota of the law that God wrote, he fulfilled. There was not one miscarriage of justice in the way that God brought about New Testament salvation. God was able to reconcile his beloved yet fallen mankind to himself, and not one, one iota of it was a mulligan. All of it, all of it was completely satisfied in Jesus Christ. God, beloved man, who fell into sin, may be with him forevermore. And it's not because God is compromising. God created the law that declared the cost of sin and then paid that in full himself. This is the ministry that began in Israel and is offered to you today freely. Call upon the name of the Lord and so be saved. I was in Louisville taking doctoral classes. I had a lot of work to do ahead of time. I had a lot of work to do afterward. I had a lot, a lot of work to do during that week. It was cheaper to Airbnb an apartment in downtown Louisville than it was to get a hotel room near the campus of Southern. And this was good because it meant that I would just be in class for like 14 hours, and then I would go back to my apartment and I'd have a ton of writing to do, and I didn't have any Campbell kids there to distract me lovingly. But I will take any excuse somebody gives me to stop doing my homework. <laughs> and I was in this apartment, downtown Louisville, trucking, you know, working at, working at this paper that was due the next day, of course. And I heard what I'm pretty sure was a 12-string guitar being played like, through the, the thin wall. And the singing, the singing that was going along with it was harmony, two voices singing in harmony. In Hebrew, I'm, I'm not getting anything done the rest of the night. And so, true, you know, those of you who know me know exactly what happened next. I, be, I began to, to drum on the wall along with the music that I heard. And then the music stopped, and it was very silent. You can picture what's happening in the room. He strummed something, and I drummed that rhythm back. He strummed something else, and I drummed that back, and there was a knock at the door. <laughs> they said, you are a drummer, man. <laughs> and we went, to, we went to the deck on the roof of this apartment building in downtown Louisville and began to talk. You could tell by his accent, and obviously by the fact that they were singing in Hebrew earlier. These guys were, these guys were from Israel. And... I had to ask, too, like, what is your belief? What is, what is your faith system? Do you, are, are you Jewish yourself? Do you adhere to that? He said, well, culturally, yes, but 
I'm, I'm an atheist. And his colleague said the same. And upon learning that he was the speechwriter for the commander of Israel's army, and he was there doing the exact same thing I was, he said, it's just cheaper to get Airbnb an apartment than it was to get a hotel for a week. And I was like, I know, right? It's just, it's just cheaper. It's just better this way. Upon hearing what he did, I was fascinated because the whole identity of Israel as a nation itself is built upon a miracle. It's built upon a fulfillment of what God said he would do in his Bible and then actually did. The lyrics to their national anthem profess this. I was like, don't you see, the, don't you see the, the incongruity between what you believe and what you do? It was very polite. It was very kind the way that I brought this up. and He, he received it well, but I was struck by that, that he didn't believe in God, yet he wrote speeches for the commander, for an army, for a nation that could only exist if the Bible's true. Because Israel was wiped out. Okay, and when nations are wiped out, they tend to stay wiped out. You understand? All right? When, it, when, when nations are defeated, when they're scattered, their currency dissolved, their government dissolved, their structure dissolved, their borders invaded and, and erased in a way, like they tend to not exist after they don't exist. Does that make sense? Because it should, because it's common sense and it's clear. But God... <laughs> As he prophesied in Ezekiel and Zechariah, as he prophesied through the prophets, as he said that he would, he would allow them to be scattered, and then he would bring them back to their land and make them a nation again. He said he would do this so that we would know that he alone is God, and above him there is no other. Okay, nations don't come back into existence. This nation was scattered. Its currency, its military, its government dissolved because God said that would happen. Then it was persecuted further because God said that would happen. I mean, the Jewish people are more persecuted than you can imagine. Somebody tried to exterminate the entire race for crying out loud. The Holocaust in Germany in the 1940s. Six million Jews systematically slaughtered. The, one, of most, one of the most horrific acts of genocide in human history. And still, and still, on a small plot of land under the jurisdiction of Great Britain, they assimilated there under the leadership of David Ben-Gurion on May 14th, 1948, with the alignment of the United States, it became a nation again. That doesn't happen. But it happened. And this guy works for that government, and he doesn't believe any of this. That's why I said, you got you to help me understand this. You've got to help me understand this. For example, who here is worried about the nation of Prussia coming back into existence? Well, I mean, Prussia hasn't been gone nearly that long compared to how long, how long Israel was gone. You realize that, right? And Israel, was, Israel was in the diaspora for like 2,000 years. Okay, Prussia hasn't been gone nearly that long. List for me in your head all the reasons why you're not worried about Prussia existing again. Well, Jesse, because they'd need a currency. They'd need a government. I know. They'd need, you know, land. I know. They'd need a military. I know. Like all the reasons you can list why Prussia won't come back into existence. Take all those and magnify them over a 2,000-year timeline. These are all the reasons why Israel shouldn't exist. But they do. And all of this was predicted in one book. So I had to know, do you believe the lyrics to your own national anthem? Or, or, is coincidence? He and I are still in touch to this day. Pray for him. All right, he's not yet a believer. Not yet. But he has at least acknowledged, he's at least acknowledged the intellectual incongruity between being the beneficiary of a promise that God made to the nation that he lives in and writing speeches for that nation while not believing that it's true. Do not think that God is done with the nation of Israel. He's not done with Israel. You understand that? He still loves his nation of Israel. He's got plans for them. When I read my Bible, I get to Revelation chapter 7, I see another prophecy of a beautiful coming revival. It describes it as 12,000 from every tribe of Israel. Come to faith in Jesus Christ. God's not done with the nation of Israel. It's so shocking to me that we as largely a crowd of Gentiles would be gathered together here. I mean, my ancestors were here on the other side of the earth during all that stuff. But here we are reading this text about God tearing down the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile. And now it's upon us to reach across and reach out to Jews who are far from God to tell them that Messiah has come. His name is Yeshua. This is what we've inherited 
This is how we apply this text. Not only to Jews, but all who are far from God. Not only this particular wall of hostility, but every wall of hostility that would create tribalism. This text is beautiful and it's exquisite, and it calls upon us to dismantle stone by stone the walls that would separate one another, God's people from God's people. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 2, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You see, have you seen cornerstones on the edges of buildings in downtown Seattle where the whole weight of the building rests on that stone? That's Jesus in this New Testament temple. All of it rests upon Jesus. And now we as Jew and Gentile alike, the old temple being torn down, this new temple being built, we together become, verse 22, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So in light of this text, I don't see how we could hold to any views of tribalism anymore. I, I think that in light of this text, we must obliterate tribalism to tear down walls of hostility that would separate us. We do well to carry on the tradition of this text in our context, reach out to those who are far from God regardless of their ethnicity, and bring them near. Because we are recipients of a promise that was once not for the primary ethnicity of our congregation. In a culture where people tend to congregate in homogeneity, the church provides the best reason imaginable to come alongside somebody else from a different walk of life, a different ethnicity, a different culture. What more beautiful thing could you possibly have in common with someone than the very thing that saves your souls? Naturally, people will congregate where they have cultural similarities, but in the church, we have the best imaginable reason to sit, by, sit beside people who come from totally different walks of life and together worship them, shoulder to, uh, worship God with them, worship God, shoulder to shoulder with them, praise Jesus, our Savior. This text speaks about tearing down walls of hostility between two cultures I believe that we should carry on that tradition in our context as well. As we do, we must be faithful to the truth. As we said at the very beginning, you must do this without compromising one iota of the gospel. You do not acquiesce in essential doctrines to reach people for Christ. Do you understand? All right, what should we do, Highlands Community Church? Shall we make the gospel of Jesus Christ more politically correct and acceptable and less offensive in order to reach people? By no means, by no means. This wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile was torn down brick by brick, not as a way of God dismantling anything that he himself had decreed beforehand, but in fulfilling that law himself. Likewise, we today don't compromise the truth in order to reach people who are far from God. Reconcile and make peace today. Jacob reconciled with Esau in the book of Genesis. You, in light of this text, can reconcile with members of your family the father and the prodigal son reconciled. You can reconcile with your children. You can reconcile with your heavenly father today. And this beautiful ministry of reconciliation passed on to us by Paul in the book of Corinthians and also here in Ephesians, we must reconcile. Members of the churches of both Ephesus and Colossae reconciled with one another. You can reconcile with your brothers and sisters in Christ with whom you have grievances. Paul reconciled with John Mark. You can reconcile with a brother or sister in Christ who holds a slightly differing view on a negotiable theological issue with you. You can reconcile. This ministry of reconciliation is so profoundly clear between Jew and Gentile in Ephesians 2, and it's ubiquitous throughout Scripture. Reconciliation is a beautiful theme throughout the Bible. Would you listen to the Holy Spirit's calling on your heart? With whom are you being called to reconcile? You cannot hear a text about reconciliation and then walk out holding on to a grudge. Listen to what the Spirit convicts you for. Make peace today because that's a gospel ministry. Reach out to those who are far from God. That's what this text does. That's what we do. Reach out to the people who are far from God. If you've been far off, welcome home. If that person who's far from God is you, where you sit today, right now, would you come home? Would you come home? Carrying on the tradition in which Paul reconciled Jew and Gentile, look at this, here's a picture of you in the church. <laughs> if you have been far from God, would you come home? 
Would you be reconciled to God? The Gentiles were far from God, out of the promises. If that's been you, in light of this text, would you today declare your belief in Jesus as the Son of God and so be saved? Would you come home? Would you be reconciled to God today? If the Holy Spirit of God is drawing upon your heart, would you pray with me here and now? God, I see the deep roots of the gospel. I see my need for reconciliation. I pray Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son that if I would believe in him, I would not die but have everlasting life. I confess, God, that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I confess, God, that the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the way. I believe that Jesus is the truth. I believe that Jesus is the life. And I know there's no way I can come to you, Father, except through Jesus. So right here and now, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Highlands Community Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me, though I was far off, be reconciled to God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.